I'm Amanda Nettlebeck from the English Discipline at the University of Adelaide and I'd like to welcome you to this Meet the Writers session with Brian Castro. Uh, Brian moved over from Melbourne to Adelaide, I think the year before last, Brian, to take up the appointment as Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Adelaide, so we are all absolutely delighted to have him as a colleague. Brian has published nine novels and a book of essays, all to great critical acclaim. Since his first novel, Birds of Passage, won the Vogel Award in 1983, his work has collected most of the significant literary prizes uh, in this country, including the Victorian Premier's Award, se several times, in fact, I think three times, um, the New South Wales Premier's Award and Book of the Year, the Queensland Premier's Award, the Age Fiction Award, the National Book Council Banjo Prize, the Christina Stead Fiction Prize and the Vance Palm F Palmer Fiction Prize. His novel The Garden Book was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Literary Award in 2006 and his latest novel The Bath Fugues was shortlisted for this year's Festival Award for Fiction and was just announced yesterday in this tent. His writing has been described as rich, rare, profound, witty and inventive and his literary voice is acknowledged as one of the most intellectually stimulating and imaginatively unique of literary voices in the contemporary arena of Australian writing. So please welcome Brian Castro. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, well, I, I find it very hard to talk about myself because I've drawn upon myself and upon my life and in virtually all my work. Um, and a writer tends to use up all his or her material, use up his or her life, as, as it were, um, aspects of other people's lives as well. So you're kind of sacrificing uh, your real life for, for the work a lot of the time. Um, and what remains, and, and the residue, if you like, of this creative venture is a working method. And my working method may have been a strange one, I think. I tried never to repeat myself even though some themes emerge consistently in my work. Never repeating yourself, of course, guarantees the moment at which you have nothing to say. <laughs> and it's a kind of failure. And I, I developed a growing confidence in failure. Failure has been my standalone, my standby pillar of strength and absolute belief throughout the whole of my writing career. Without the idea of absolute failure, without knowing that I could sink to the bottom in despair with thoughts of extinction, of complete hopelessness, I would never have written. And without the idea of catastrophe, which contains the letters of my name, I would never have, <laughs> oh, I would never have found the inspiration for any of my books. And this gave me the tenacity and I think the perseverance necessary for becoming a writer. But of course, this wasn't everything. And I don't know why failure and despair came to me at an early age. I suspect it is partly genetic. One day they will discover, if they haven't done so already, the gene or genome for melancholy. So my mother was desperately melancholic. And it wasn't depression as such, because there were moments when she was very happy in her melancholia. Happy in a way that said to you, this sadness of the world would lead to a better way of thinking about it. Happy in the way that said to you, you can survive anything. And by surviving everything, you will be a witness in your own right, in your own way, to the events of the world. Now, of course, she didn't express it this way. She would have said, if you eat, you will feel better. Or food is life. I think this was her terrible secret. I mean, melancholia, not food. Well, although she was a great eater. She lived until the age of 94. And at the age of 94, she said to me, that's enough. I've taught you enough. And she survived my father for by 25 years. Her secret was that sadness, if you could handle it, made you a better person. She was what the French called a passeiste, a person who lived in the past. And out of this past life in the China of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, she gave me the flavours and the horrors of an emerging nation. She gave me a sense of the real and a respect for history. My father thought totally differently. Having survived the Japanese war and then the communist ascendancy in China, having been a colonial master and then a European outcast, he couldn't live with the real. 
He was always dreaming of the tomorrow when he would be rich again. He constantly sought happiness as a solution. And of course, it never came. The China he knew as a Portuguese colonial and as a well-traveled do well doyen of the world of imports and exports would never come to him again. It was then that he saw me as the best prospect for exportation. Perhaps I could regain his tomorrows. I'd always been groomed for export. From the age of four, I was sent to British schools in Hong Kong, then to the United States at the tender age of six, together with an older half-sister, to learn how to live the great American dream. And upon returning to Hong Kong, I was sent to a school run by the Marion Old Sisters, a Dominican order from Virginia, who gave me, and to this day I well remember it, an appreciation of protein in diet. <laughs> and, because it, and because it was mainly a girls' school, my first experience of love. And this, in a way, compensated for the gaps in my parents' personalities. In the Hong Kong of the 1950s, many German expatriates made their fortunes. And one of these was the chief executive officer of Volkswagen. And the head of Volkswagen Hong Kong had a daughter of exquisitely blonde pre-Raphaelite hair, and she became my first love obsession. I had fallen desperately in love at the age of eight, and I was convinced I would marry Maria Jung, whose first test of my undying devotion was to force me to eat a mound of bacon, something my father had told me was unclean. I passed the test, but something in me told me that love was always going to be difficult. It was always behind a pane of glass, and this was another formation of my being a writer. Love was contained in writing, not in life. Expression of it was always going to be, it seemed to me, for the unreflective. Romantic love was and is a kind of solo experience which pertained to an ideal and not to reality because it was always unequal. Which brings me to this solo session. Well, I've always been flying solo. At the age of 11, I was put on board a Qantas plane in the care of what was then called an air hostess and flown from Hong Kong to Australia to a boarding school in Sydney. And being Australian, the air hostess spoke with a strange accent. I could barely understand a word. Yet I think I fell in love with her language. It was the first time I'd taken account of the way language could inspire intimacy. And I think this became the formation of my literary life. You can imagine an 11 year old boy traveling alone in the care of a blonde mother figure who used the English language in strange ways. And besides, she called me lovey. <laughs> I thought I would marry her when I grew up. Well, I knew nobody in Australia, and this was my father's idea of my getting an education abroad and to make myself into a man. I was never to return. My father's business collapsed, and he was without a job, and I was farmed out to various families, many of which were country folk. And on their stations and farms, I learned about horses and sheep. That's probably one of the reasons why I've never lived in cities. I spent a lot of my life in the Blue Mountains, in the Dandenong Ranges, and only recently bought a place in... Allgate in the Adelaide Hills. So I'm certainly not a city boy. Well, it was an invaluable education. But the thing I learned most of all was solitude. And within that solitude began to write letters at first and then diaries. The critic and writer George Steiner had this to say about solitude. And I quote, solitude and privacy are cognate to silence. Their informing role in the creator's workshop is intuitively convincing. Solitude has, in our societies, become rarer and indeed suspect. A dread of solitude, an incapacity to experience it productively, haunts the young. Background music switches on when the door of an elevator closes in American buildings, lest the moments of aloneness prove threatening. Democracy and mass consumption, with their ideals of uniformity, of peer group acceptance and approval, condemn solitariness. There is, in solitude, a natural aristocracy, a refusal of belonging." Unquote. Well, I wouldn't have put it that way while sitting on my suitcase at Mascot Airport, waiting for one of my teachers to arrive to drive me to the school. And I suppose this was a kind of stolen generation moment for me. I knew I had to survive, and I felt an intense sense of not being like the rest who had families and homes, and that one day the script that was running through my head would be sent out into the world, which is, I suppose, what I'm doing now. 
The strange thing was that the moment at which I began to write, I was transformed into someone else. It wasn't about me. I think there were two reasons why this came about. The obvious reason is that the imagination works over time to transfer oneself into another, to live the lives of others. The second, I think, the more important reason was that I was hopelessly short-sighted at the age of seven. And this partial blindness made me into an eavesdropper. I was also a withdrawn child hiding under beds and tables. And I got to hear stories told in different languages and tried to puzzle through them to give them some meaning. Because as a child, meaning doesn't come easily, particularly if a lot of the stories demand a knowledge of other people's personal experiences, contexts and intertexts, imaginative memory and recall. I think this sense of listening in rather than engaging in voyeurism, which is peculiarly visual and secretive, gave me a sense of joining into silent conversations and interior monologues. Maybe that is why I distrust reported speech and loathe inverted commas. As Herta Müller said recently in her Nobel Prize acceptance speech, I quote, writing is a silent act, labor from the head to the hand, the mouth is skipped over. So when I wrote my seventh novel, Shanghai Dancing, this formation of silence within noise became clearer to me. I found that I enjoyed reading biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, letters and diaries much more than I enjoyed reading novels. When I first discovered the German writer W.G. Seibolt, I noted he wrote meditations, elegies, mutations of essays rather than traditional novels. And these had a strange sense of silence about them. This seemed to me what I was also interested in doing. In an interview before his tragic death, Seibolt said, I'm a much more passionate reader than I'm a writer. What interests me is incidental writing of various kinds, memoirs, bulky memoirs, sometimes by lesser-known figures. In fiction, one rarely comes across real surprises, but in memoirs or in diaries or volumes of letters, there are, there are always unexpected things that you could never have dreamt of, and it's for that reason that I read widely. Well, as far as I'm concerned, reading is also a silent act. It requires solitude and a sense of catastrophe, knowing that there is an expectation that the house will fall down, the parents will break up, the children will become dysfunctional and feral. And while this expectation is not dramatic but normal in the modern world, it's redemption and recuperation through linguistic means from another world and another time makes it special. Writing produces an atmosphere of anxiety, anxiety about a dead time that is part imagined, part archived and part lived. Well, here's an example of how this kind of solitary, anxious experience informed my writing through the experience of leaving, of being abandoned, of abandoning others, a feeling which is transformed into a narrative within the construct of a novel. This is from the middle section of my latest book, The Bath Fugues. Coimbra, Portugal. The slow drip of a Sunday complaint on the 14th day of January 1894 fell drop by drop with faint determination from the roof of my numbered door. Rosaries of rain running into braids of gutted music, down pipes of depression, smells of fungus, more. Tomorrow I will leave my father's house lugging two small suitcases into the tumid tram smelling of horse, eyes cast down to run the obstacle course of half-digested oats, while up above dark faces at the greasy glass will grin at my discomfort. The air is thick with garlic and ripe overcoats, and I garner no empathy. I'm from a line with an ancient deformity, just five feet high and hydrocephalic. Family law has it that we will always be granted one concession to beauty, unfortunately always illegitimate. That's the fee. My name is Camilo Concesao. The family concession hasn't fallen upon me. Leaving home finally, I did not want my mother there. Her position was not one that was justified by marriage. Instead, she would have been out of place in her condition amongst my father's friends and colleagues who were milling about the carriage. They sent me off in style, gave me money to continue my studies. And even as a junior magistrate, I did my father proud and he held me saying, Sonny, come back soon. And then there was Anna, my good friend's sister, letting herself be kissed for the first time on the mouth, my heart all a flutter, 
her hard lips when she whispered that I would be missed. And suddenly my mother appeared in her shabby dress, crying aloud, her face a mess of tears and mud from the potatoes she'd been peeling. My father had already turned away and disappeared into the crowd, which pretended not to see what I had always feared. Her imploring hands, her trembling prayer reeling between novenas, and I placed some money in her hands, their backs still covered in farina, and saw her frown, and I ran for the horse-drawn tram, away from town, still hearing her exclamation. I bore him from my loins, and now he gives me coins. I'm not proud of being amongst bad seeds, which have sprung unplanned in life's dark row, but I shall not go down on hypocritical knees when my father has been my foe. I sit in the carriage like a mouse with cheese and watch schoolgirls on my corner wave goodbye to me, giggling at the lawyer's son they knew was a bastard without beauty, and the next century will be lit beneath a darkling sky, and young brides who fasted for their wedding day will play their games reciting my verses, those which lasted, rung by rung, performed with a mocking bow. Camilo Concesson, a poet by any other name, would sound as bad when sung with rhymes, conceived in shame. Didn't you know his father had laid a coloured parlour maid? Sunday, December 1894. I set sail on a rusty vapour boat from Marseille, a trading vessel smeared in oil, a sardine can, fumes forcing me up on deck in a soiled pea coat. From time to time, with no appetite to spoil, out of sheer fatigue at sea grey monotony, I repair below, edged to my cabin at the far end near the boiler room, past the temporary bar set up for six professors of botany, fellow travellers to the east. Specimens themselves, behind salted glass, they feast on boiled eggs and beer, a plate of cod for those lucky enough to have the money. I pass, they leer. I have no means and they have no pity. They guffaw at jellyfish specimens they've hung on the gunwale, dissecting them with razors, prodding at a tentacle, which, like nettle, produces a sting. Men tend to laugh when stung. Soon they will be dissecting me, calling me a weird thing. In the denser darkness of nighttime swells, strange glitters erupt ahead. From deep arcades and infinite wells, black water heaves up jewellery from the dead. A glowing trail, Ardentia Maratima, drowned souls making their frail way up to heaven. My crate of unread books wedged with tins of lima beans slides about beneath the bunk. I could drag this life raft out before Cape Horn if the ship were sunk, or hull hauled by a pirate in the China Sea, I'll defend the decks with Dostoevsky. In Macau the ship began to berth, reversing its propellers. The sea had turned metallic and slabs of swell formed into colours, a marbled collation of seaweed and debris as the steamer backed up and from the deep rose a phallic gush, a rush of foam, a flush of catacombs, blind dream of ancient bone, a resurrection. Finally, I was in China, I, standing at the bow, born again, I, Judge Concesao, am here to rule. So, who could have been a better fool? Thank you.